As pretty much everyone knows, I'm a pretty big fan of the M4 medium tank, also known as the M4 Sherman. The M4 was used extensively during World War II, and was used as a testbed for a plethora of experimental equipment. So I got to thinking, if you put all late war Sherman projects into a single vehicle, what would that look like? Turns out that by doing so, you can replace pretty much every major component except for the hull. So let's see what we can do. First, let's take a look at replacing the engine. The most powerful service engine the M4 ever mounted was the 500 horsepower 4 GAA, giving it a power to weight ratio of 14.9 horsepower per metric ton. The most powerful experimental engine the US ever mounted in the M4 was the A65 Multibank, which was rated at 650 gross horsepower and 580 net horsepower. The hull of an M4A4 had to have an additional 9.5 inches added to the length. The engine proved to be reliable, and greatly improved the M4's automotive performance. Despite this, the A65 was never approved for service, likely due to how much production line retooling would need to be done. Next is the transmission. The M4 originally mounted a synchro mesh transmission, with 5 forward speeds and 1 reverse speed. This gave the M4 a somewhat sluggish reverse rate, which wasn't addressed for a while, as it was believed that this low reverse rate allowed it to better reverse up slopes. Eventually, a planetary gearbox was installed that allowed the M4 to reverse at 21 miles per hour, or 33 kilometers per hour. The planetary gearbox also showed no serious defects or unreliability, and it was approved for service. However, the end of World War II meant that the gearbox was never put in service. Now onto the turret and gun. The original turret with the 75mm was replaced with a T23 turret and 76mm gun in 1944. This new turret also implemented wet ammunition stowage, which filled the ammunition compartments with a water glycol mixture once the compartment was pierced. This greatly reduced the chance of an ammunition fire. There was also a project that mated the turret from a T26E3, what would later become the M26 Pershing, in the hull of an M4A3. This was quite simple to do, as the M4 and M26 both had a turret ring diameter of 69 inches. This modification allowed the M4 to carry a 90mm cannon and a fully enclosed turret. The vehicle was approved for service initially, but this was later changed, because it was realized that by the time this new vehicle would be entering production, the M26 Pershing would already be in Europe and they didn't want to divert the production of M26 turrets. The 90mm Sherman also came with drawbacks, namely the lack of wet ammunition stowage, and the reduction in overall ammunition capacity. There are a few other options for replacement turrets if we move further into the post-war era. Conveniently, the M41 and M46 both have 69-inch turret ring diameters. The M41 turret would allow for faster turret traverse, and the higher velocity 76mm M32 cannon. However, if you instead go back and look at the M41's prototype, the T41, you can have advantages like a rangefinder, stabilizer, and autoloader. These technologies were obviously either not worth it or not ready, as the M41 doesn't have them. There is also the T49 turret, which was an M41 with a 90mm gun and rangefinder installed. Of course, the M41, T41, and T49 all have significantly worse armor protection, being light tanks, but tanks don't usually survive a hit anyway, so that has to be taken into account. The M46 turret wouldn't make much of a difference, at least compared to the M26 turret, as the M26 could also mount the M46's M3A1 cannon, but the turret would look slightly cooler. The M4 was also used to test the viability of a dual-axis stabilizer. Dual-axis stabilizers were tested for the 75mm during World War II, with testing for the 76mm occurring afterwards. The stabilizers tested were shown to be superior to the single-axis stabilizer already in use on the M4, though they did have issues, primarily with vibration. If our ultimate Sherman retained the original 76mm, it could have a dual-axis stabilizer, but if it moved to the 90mm, it would have a single-axis stabilizer, assuming that none of the Bulldog turrets were used. Then there's the armor. In the European theater, some units welded spare upper front plates to their M4s, doubling the thickness from 63.5mm to 127mm. This gave the front plate of their M4s an effective thickness of 186mm, when accounting for the plate's angle. If you wanted better all-around protection, you could use the hull of a Sherman Jumbo, not that the armor would be worth much if you went the Bulldog turret route. For suspension, torsion bars were tested on an M4A2, and were found to provide a somewhat more stable ride. The torsion bars were not approved for service, as they were much more difficult to maintain than the VVSS and HVSS bogies, which were simply bolted onto the hull. So where does all that leave us? Here are some estimated stats. Weight, 38 metric tons. Horsepower, 650 gross, 580 net. Power to weight ratio. 17.10 horsepower per ton gross, and 15.26 net. Top speed, 50 km per hour. Top reverse speed, 33 km per hour. Ground pressure, around 12 psi. Max armor penetration, around 260 mm. Maximum plate thickness, 127 mm. Fire control, rangefinder, 
single axis stabilizer for the 90, dual axis stabilizer for the 76. So what was the point of all of this? I really have no clue. Actually making this vehicle in reality was nowhere near practical, let alone possible in some cases. Some of these parts didn't work all that well, and probably wouldn't work well together. I guess the moral of the story is, just because you can do something, doesn't mean you should. Just because a vehicle theoretically could do something, doesn't mean it was the best decision. I hope you learned at least something. If not, sorry for wasting your time on a dumb thought experiment. As always, hope you guys enjoyed the video, and I'll see you on the next one. Thank you.